So, um, yes, environmental farming scheme, higher level, engaging a planner. So we'll take a, a quick run through this. We'll not, um, we'll not bog you down in, in too much detail. Um, it's just a, an overview, really. So I tend to keep this slide in, in all the presentations. Um, I do free FAS, um, kind of regardless of what the topic is. This is good just as a, a reminder. So the aim of EFS hire, so this it may be new for folks maybe that um, haven't been in EFS before or haven't been in the other agri-environment schemes before. So the purpose of EFS is really to bring designated sites and priority habitats and species under favorable management. So that's the that's the goal at the at the end. So priority habitats. Um, so as I mentioned, um, some folks um, have been in schemes in the past, um, but there will be some here tonight uh, that possibly are new to agri environment schemes. So EFS could be their first agri environment scheme. So just to give an overview of of priority habitats um, and uh, and those types of topics. So what are priority habitats? So these are semi-natural areas that are valuable to nature. So essentially these are, are areas or fields, if you like, that contain something growing there that would naturally be growing there um, without much intervention from man. So it's things, um, it's plants in the, in the sward maybe that are growing there and they're growing there because of the way the land has been farmed. So if you have one of these areas you have been farming in, in a way that has allowed these these plants and these species to exist really. They cover a wide variety of land types. So we can have uh, semi-natural areas that can be grasslands, we can have wetlands, we can have woodlands, we can have moorlands or peatlands if you um if you're from the from the uplands, or um we have some coastal areas. So the priority habitats that are on your farm. <clears throat> will fall into one of those categories. And you can see at the bottom there, there is a significant value to these areas. So uh, there's a value really um, to yourselves and to the scheme. But it's also a value to wider society in general, because these areas are um, significant in their importance to nature. So just a little background on EFS, just um, where we are now. This is, this is tranche six. We had 493 eligible applications for EFS hire. Once those applications were made, there was various application checks that were completed in the background. And kind of falling out of that, um, it was clear that there was about 248 of these applications that require an external planner, which is really why we're here tonight to talk about the, the external planner process. Um, letters of offer then uh, were issued to um, those those eligible applicants that, that could go forward. Um, one final point you'll see down at the bottom, and Nicola has already touched on it, um, EFS groups. If you are in an EFS group of some sort, you should make contact with your group facilitator as soon as possible, because that, 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 that's someone that may be able to offer you the planner service or certainly point you in the right direction. So if you're in an EFS group, that's your, your first point of contact. Just the basics. Um, again, this this may be new to, to some folk that are that are fresh into EFS. So your your planner prepares your five year plan. So your your plan is referred to as your SSRMP. So that stands for your site specific remedial management plan, and that's the plan that's drawn up and is with you for five years. It's a contract between you and your EFS planner. So. For those that were in previous schemes, um, you will find a difference here. Um, in the previous scheme, somebody from countryside management branch in, in the Department of Agriculture would have came out and set up your scheme. So they would have classified the land and discussed it with you and set up your scheme. This is different in EFS. This is a, a private arrangement between you and an external planner to set up your scheme. So you can see there, I've already covered it. It's, it's a private arrangement. There's a list of planners who have attended DERA training um, on the DERA website. Uh, you can see over in the, on the right-hand side of your screen, this is just a, a, a snap or a, a image I've taken from the DERA website. And um, you can see down at the bottom here, there's a document that says EFS hire tranche six environmental planners. Um, I think from memory, I found that just on a Google search. So I just typed in EFS, uh, 
environmental planners and it, it got me there. Um, failing that, you can navigate to it on the EFS section of the, the DEER website. So there's a list of planners on there. As you would expect, they're um, residing in, in different areas of the country. So um, you can have a look at it and see if there's somebody that, that possibly suits you. <clears throat> a few more of the, the basics. So um, I will just run through this point at a time. So you can see at the top there, the cost of the EFS planner fee can be partially or fully recouped. Um, we'll have a wee look at that in a second. Uh, payment dates and amounts should be agreed in advance. So it's up to you, as we've said in the previous slide, it's a private arrangement between you and your planner. So it's up to you how much, um, how much money you agree and uh, what the payment date for that is. So you agree the amount and you agree uh, the date that you're going to pay your planner. Once you do find a planner, uh, there is a, a quite a brief uh, form to fill in. It's called the nomination form for an authorised person. Again, that's on the EFS section of the, the DEER website and it's likely something um, I would imagine that the planner uh, will have or certainly will be able to direct you to if you can't find it yourself. So before we do the last point, if you um, just look over to the, the right hand side of your screen, you'll see there is a, a blue table here. So this gives you uh, an idea of, of, of the, the amount that could be, the, certainly the, the limited amount that could be paid back to you from the department. So really, um, if you can think about it from the start of the process to the finish, you find a planner, you have agreed an amount that you are going to pay that planner. Um, once the plan is, is completed, then the Department of Agriculture can recompensate you um, a certain amount, which may be some or all of your fee. So if we take just the first two, um, two lines here as an example. So if the area you were entering into EFAS was um, up to five hectares, the maximum amount that the Department of Agriculture could pay you back would be 400 pounds. Uh, if we take another example, if, you, um, if your EFS higher area um, that you're bringing into the scheme was between 10 and 20 hectares, you can see the maximum amount that you could claim back is 600 pounds. So, as I've said previously, the amount that you pay your planner is a private arrangement. So that's up to you to negotiate with your planner. But there is a limit to the, to the amount that you will then be recompensated. So if you are bringing in an area up to five hectares and you um, agree that you're going to pay your planner 500 pound, for example, the most that you could claim back for uh, against that there is 400 pounds. So the money that you claim back, it may be part of the planner fee or it may be all of the planner fee. And it just depends what you have agreed with your planner in terms of, uh, in terms of finance, in terms of how much you're going to pay that planner to complete your plan. So it's important to note that there is limits as to the money that you will receive back. So that's important to keep in mind whenever you're negotiating a price uh, with the planner. Just down at the, the very bottom, um, it's not something that will maybe impact too many. So if the EFS planner cost is projected to exceed £2,000, uh, and that would generally be, if we look over at our table here, that would generally be for farms over 100 hectares, an estimate of the actual cost must be submitted to DERA for approval before proceeding. So if your plan is going to cost more than £2,000, the planner has to... Uh, submit that to DERA for approval before they go ahead. So uh, it's very important, do it before the actual plan is done. Um, it's too late after the plan is done. So if it's going to cost more than £2,000, you have to get approval before you proceed. <clears throat> so uh, a run through of an overview of the process. So we've, we've four steps here. So we can see in step one, we have discussion with your EFS planner, so that's your initial discussions. Step two, your planner prepares your plan. Step three, discussion with the EFS planner, so that's after the plan has been completed. And then step four, the planner submits the plan to DERA on your behalf. So we can see I have a red star above step three, um, just to highlight the importance of that. If we can get step three um, right, then 
most of the other issues that occur will rectify themselves. So <clears throat> we'll just run through some of the detail on those steps. So your engagement with your EFS planner is key in this process. So that is, it's absolutely key. I can't stress that enough. Again, as I've mentioned, um, some people possibly new to EFS, possibly new to agri-environment schemes uh, in general. So what should you discuss with your planner? So you've made an appointment, this planner's coming. What should you discuss? What, what should you have prepared? So the first thing is uh, your initial aspirations for EFS. So what do you hope to get out of EFS? What is your, what is your aim of the scheme? Past management of your EFS higher land. So whether that's those, uh, if it's a grassland, if it's a, a moorland or a peatland, or it's a, a woodland or a wetland, you need to give your planner an idea of how you've been managing that in the past. So that might include things like the types of livestock that you have on there, uh, the, the times of the year that you have them on there, and the numbers that you would normally have on there, as well as other things like silage cutting, hay cutting, things like that. So. It's, it's an overview of your past management. The third one here you'll see is underlined, um, how will the requirements impact me? So in that initial discussion, you really should get an idea of how the EFS requirements are going to have an impact on you. And that'll give you a guide as to whether you can adjust your management to meet the requirements. Uh, at the bottom, um, this will probably only be applicable to um, a very small number of people, so potential double funding. So if there's something on your farm, an environmental measure, it could be a hedge that's been planted or a block of woodland or various other things. If there's something you have received funding from another another body, um, then you need to make your planner aware of that because you want to avoid a situation where you're being double funded, funded under EFS for something and then also being funded for the same thing from another source. So that's your initial discussion, your initial asp aspirations, how you've been managing the land in the past, and how will the requirements impact me? So moving on to step two. Again, this will be uh, completely new to some folks. So what does my planner do? So your planner will visit and assess the habitat in each field. Uh, they will select the appropriate habitat for that field and they will select appropriate NPIs or, or capital items. So going back to the start again, we'll go through it. The planner will visit and assess the habitat in each of those fields. So in EFS higher, there is a range of habitats that, that land falls into. So in, within grasslands, there is a range of habitats. Within woodlands, there's a range of habitats and the same for, for moorlands. So the planner will go to each of those fields and if we look at, just as an example, if we um, if we look at this picture down at the bottom here, so that's a grassland field. Um, we can see there is um, there is uh, natural plants growing in here. So um, we have uh, Devil's Bit Scabious, which is our, our blue flowers here. So that field, when the planner visited, he would look at it, see what's growing there, and he would classify that as what we call purple rush grass. So that's PRG. So that's a fairly common EFS habitat. So he'll pick the appropriate habitat for each field. He will also select the appropriate uh, NPIs or, or capital items. Now what those are, um, basically those are things like fences and gates. So if you have a field of our, our purple rush grass and you need to split that field from a different habitat to manage it better, the planner will put on an, a length of fencing to allow you to divide this habitat off. So you will be able to manage the stocking uh, rates and the stocking dates better. So it's, it's to fine tune the management. That's really what our, our capital items are. It's the same for gates and uh, there's a few other items in there as well. So once the planner has selected our habitat, he has selected our, our capital items, so our uh, fences and our gates and things, he will then enter that information online. So in step three, and if you remember, this was the one we had the, the red star at, just to stress its importance. So discussing your plan. So discuss the SSRMP content. So that's your, the, the content in your plan. So whenever you discuss that, um, that'll cover things like the management requirements. So for 
we go back to the example of our grassland field, what are the requirements for slurry spreading? What are the dates that I can graze my animals? And how many can I graze there? So each habitat has its own management requirements. Um, they're, they're set out quite clearly. So you need to look at those there. You need to discuss those with your planner to ensure that you can comply with those. Moving on down, what work have I agreed to complete? So that'll be our going back to our fences and our, our gates. Um, it could also include other things like uh, hedge planting or, or planting areas of trees possibly. So you, you should discuss with your planner and ensure that you know the work that you have agreed to complete. Record keeping. So um, your planner will give you an idea of what records you need to keep. So an EFS, you have records to keep for each of your management units. Um, so that'll include, that'll include things like grazing dates, so the, the, the dates that you had your animals on, how many were there for, or how many animals were there at that, at that point. And specifications and timing. So specifications, that will include things like our, there's a specification for all of the, of the work that you would complete. So if you have fences to put up to, to better manage your grassland that we looked at, there's a specification for that. And that covers things like the height of the fence, um, the diameter of the posts and um, the distances of the posts can be apart. So those are just to ensure that the work that you complete is is up to a standard that is um, is it's across of all all of EFS. And then just underlined, you'll see how will this affect me. So those four things um, you will need to discuss with your planner, and you will need to see how that affects you. Now, I <clears throat> more than understand. Um, it's probably a lot of information to get in a very short space of time. So your planner has went around the farm. He has looked at all the fields and he comes back to you and um, he gives you all this information. So it's a lot to take in. So I would certainly recommend, if, if not insist, that the planner gives you a summary document. So gives you a, a summary of what he has, um, he or she have proposed. Um, that will allow you to uh, reflect on that when the planner goes away. So you, you can then look at that um, when you have a bit more time and you can look through it, look at those management requirements and look at the work that is that is on your plan for you to complete. And it just gives you a bit of extra time to consider things before the actual plan arrives with you. You'll see down at the bottom then, so raise any issues or concerns you have um, Different to previous schemes where things could have been changed uh, around a little bit um, after it had been issued. Uh, with EFS, it's, it's generally too late after your agreement has been issued. So we can't really go back and change things once everything is, is finalized. So can't stress enough, once the planner has um, had, a look, had a look around and has a, a rough idea of a plan, you need to discuss that with your planner and get him or her to give you a summary document that allows you to see the key points and then within that raise any issues or, or concerns that you have. So step four, um, fairly straightforward at the end of the process. So um, the documentation is submitted by the planner to DERA for consideration. So your EFS planner um, agrees a declaration. I would just put this. I just put this in as an example, um, and this includes the sentence. And it says the applicant is aware of and has agreed to the management requirements that will be specified in the subsequent hire scheme agreement. So that's basically saying I have made the applicant, which is yourselves here tonight, aware of of everything that's in the plan, and they are in they are in agreement with it. So going back to step three. We just want to make sure that um, you have a, a discussion with the planner and that you're happy with everything that is in there and that you can adapt your management to to, to, to meet those um, to meet those those requirements. So what happens next after the plan has been submitted? So we'll run through these uh, quickly so we can see it that at the top here. So DERA consider your plan and your supporting documentation if there is any. Any errors or queries, um, if any errors or queries are, are turned up, they are returned to your planner. So 
in the background um, in countryside management branch, they will check the plan to ensure that the habitats are broadly correct and a few that a few other things are in line. So if they notice any any queries, they'll return them to your planner, and that planner then has an opportunity to fix whatever whatever issues have been um, have been raised. So if approved, the agreement then is issued to you via the DERA online services portal. Um, that's the same portal that you would do your basic payment scheme application. Um, I'm sure most people are, are familiar with it, or certainly your, your agent, if you have one, will be. And then at the very bottom uh, in the blue, you'll see you will go online and then decide to accept or decline your agreement. So, and again, that's done on the online services portal. So what makes up my agreement? Now, I will not spend too much time on this because it's probably a it's probably a topic for another time. So an agreement consists of a site-specific remedial management plan. So that's that SSRMP that we, we mentioned earlier. So that's, that's your plan. And there's a map that accompanies that. That map has the details of what your habitats are and the locations of any fences, uh, gates, and things like that. It also includes commitment schedule. So that's really a, a summary document. And that gives a list of the options and um, capital items that you have agreed to complete. So your commitment schedule is a very good um, thing to have to hand, um, just, just to remind you of, of what commitments you have. And then, as you would expect, there's terms and conditions. So there's EFS higher terms and conditions. So a, a quick um, look at a site-specific remedial management plan. So as we've mentioned, it's a five-year plan. It's prepared by the planner and then uh, agreed with you. Uh, for each field, it shows your EFS option habitat. So if we think back to our grassland, that could be our, our purple rush grass. Um, it could be blanket bog. It could be uh, oak woodland. It could be wet woodland. There's a range of habitats in there. And it includes for each field the work that you have agreed to complete. So again, that's our Fences or gates, um, lengths of hedge planting, um, possibly tree planting. Um, so the work that you have elected to complete in each field. Your plan also includes detailed information on grazing dates and rates, um, record keeping requirements and management requirements. So for each of your habitats, there will be a different period that you can graze your animals there and a specific number of animals that you can have on that um, at, at any one time or on average. So it's important that you know what your habitats are, uh, what that means in terms of grazing dates and uh, stocking rates, and then also what work that is in your plan, what work has the planner added on that you have said that you can complete. So just, and it might be quite small for some, but just over on the, the right hand side of the screen, that's just a, a little snip that I have taken out of a, an actual plan. So that's what it'll look like if you get that length and you see it on the online portal. So you can see this is just for your farm will be split into management units. So this is management unit one and that uh, that takes in four fields. So it will be four fields that run together. Um, your farm is split into management units just to help with the record keeping. So it cuts down on the on the amount of records you, you have to keep. So instead of on a field basis, it'll be on a management unit basis. So why is communication with your planner key? So just some past experiences. Uh, again, you can see that the first one is underlined. So uh, these are things that uh, inspectors have, have found when they've been out doing inspections. So poor understanding of your, of your SSRMP or your, your plan that has been drawn up by your planner. Not adhering to grazing dates and rates. So in that example, the inspectors went out and um, looked at a habitat and there is livestock there that um, shouldn't be there at that time of the year. Overambitious, um, something we're probably all um, guilty of. I know I certainly am. Um, so uh, you've been, your planner's been drawing your plan up. Um, you've thought to yourself, well, I maybe could do five, six hundred, seven hundred meters of a fence. Um, but with other other bits and pieces of work, the weather, 
um, sourcing materials and things kick in, um, it's maybe too ambitious. So only really, um, only really uh, undertake what you can cope with. Minimum specifications. So um, there is a minimum specification for all the work that you will complete. So if you look over the right hand side there, if we take that fence as an example, there is a minimum specification for that. So there's a, a diameter for those posts. There's a, a minimum height for the fence. So we need to ensure, or you need to ensure that if you are doing work, that it meets that minimum specification. Following on from that, work completed in the wrong locations. Um, probably the worst one for inspectors. So the inspector goes out and finds your fence in field five. Um, you had a discussion with your planner back when he was setting up your scheme and <clears throat> you had there had been an error that had crept in. It should have been in field four, but you put it in, in field three or field five. Um, as time has moved on, it just as an error has crept in. So we want to try and minimize that there. Um, it's the last thing the inspectors want is you going to the expense of doing work and it's in the wrong field. So that goes back to discussion with the planner and just ensure that you're clear on all the locations um, and all your all your habitats. Over declarations, um, in that case, that will concern um, a, 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 on your claim. Um, you may have declared that you completed a hundred meters of a of your fence here, but in reality, it maybe only was ninety meters or eighty meters. In some instances, you will make your claim. Well, you will you will always make your claim uh, in May time, the same time as basic payment scheme. But there will be cases where you haven't the work completed at that stage. Um, so you may be going out to do your fence later in the summer. So you might have claimed for 100 metres, but something could have changed in between. Maybe part of it was too wet or you just didn't get part of it done. So you need to make sure that if you've, if you've made your claim, you go back and check just to be sure that it reflects what's, act, what's actually on the ground. Um, probably one of the, the major differences with the EFS from previous schemes. In previous schemes, you could have five or maybe seven years to split your work across. So if you take a planting a hedge as an example, you could have had five years or maybe seven years to do that work. EFS is different. Um, the vast majority, if not all of your um, the work that you elect to complete will be done in the first year and paid for in the first year. So that's an important change from previous schemes. Um, so just ensure that whatever you undertake, essentially that you can do it in the, in the first year. And then moving down to the bottom, just records not completed. So that's folks not being aware that they had to keep those records for their um, for their for their different um, management units. So if we can um, correct the poor understanding of the SSRMP um, to ensure that people are aware of what's in that plan for each of their fields, then generally the rest of that list um, will will take care of itself. Certainly. The vast majority of it anyway. So just a few things we want to avoid and these are extremely common sentences um, that the inspectors hear. So just moving kind of from the, from the top round clockwise. So planner never told me I couldn't graze in certain months. So all our different EFS habitats have different grazing periods um, that you can have your animals on there. So you need to be sure that you're grazing within those correct months. Obviously as well, the payment rates um, for those habitats are reflective of that. So you are, your EFS payment is compensating you for adjusting your management to meet the requirements for the various habitats that you have. Just moving around into the middle at the top then, um, I didn't know I had to do all my fencing in year one. Um, just mentioned that in the previous slide. It's different from from our, our older schemes where work was split over um, a number of years. So in EFS, most, if not all of your fencing and other work will be completed and paid for in year one. Uh, moving across uh, to the right hand side, no one told me about record keeping. Again, um, a fairly common message. Um, we would always advise folks just to keep records at the time. It's, it's, it's much easier than having to go back later on and try and and recount things. Moving down to the bottom, um, I didn't know I could amend my claim. So if you make your claim, you can generally always amend that 
if you find that uh, maybe you um, haven't done as much as that you thought you had. Moving into the middle, um, I thought it had to be completed in this field. Um, typically occurs whenever um, someone has met their planner in, in step three and the planner has give them a quick rundown in possibly 30 minutes of what has to be done, um, possibly not written down. The plan has come out and someone then has remembered it wrongly and completed it in field four instead of field three. So it's a fairly common thing, but it's something that we want if we can uh, make sure everyone reads their plan, we can uh, eliminate things like that. Um, the very last one, um, I haven't read my plan or uh, your plan or your SSRMP, your site specific remedial management plan. So if you get that far, it's a document that it'll be on the online portal. You can go on and read it. Um, I know from our side on the system, um, we can see who has read it. Um, we can see who has accepted it and see who has read it. Um, it's essential to get a good foundation for the five years going forward that you read that plan and that you are aware of its content. Um, if, if you only take one thing away from this tonight, that should be it. That whenever you get your plan, read it and make sure that you are happy with this content. Um, we'll put up a few contact details at the end. Whenever you do read your plan, if there is anything you want help with or clarification, we are more than uh, more than willing to um, to uh, help you with it or help you understand it. And um, there, there's there's value. We see value in all of the EFS hire agreements. They they serve a very good purpose, and we want to try and assist you as as much as possible to ensure that we get it right. So just a few more um, past experiences. Let me see. Yeah, so that's us um, there. So what does change look like? Um, I normally keep this slide in towards the end because it is. It's sometimes a picture says says more than um, more than a lot of words. So what does change look like? So you can see on your left hand side, you see we have a woodland that was used for a, a bit of supplementary feeding. We can see the the ring feeder here and it is um, it's badly poached. There's been a fair number of stock going in and out of there. And you can see on the right hand side, if you flip across, that's a woodland that has been uh, fenced off and um, the animals no longer access there. So you can see the difference quite clearly um, between the two. And you can see the value in terms of uh, nature and the environment. Um, you can see the difference, the difference between the two. Um, a few contacts that I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. So we have the EFS telephone number um, and we have the EFS email address. Um, I would encourage use of the email address just where possible because it, it does make things easier. Um, if you put your, your query and your business number on there, um, it allows the member of the team that uh, answers your email, they can just look in the background before they contact you they can have a look at the fields on the map or they can have a look at your agreement and it gives them a bit of background knowledge um, before they go back to you. Um, sometimes easier than on the phone whenever um, you maybe just you just can't turn up the information. So put your query on an email. Um, as I said earlier on, um, we will be more than happy to get back to you and try and iron out any um, any problems that there are. Okay, Nicola. Great, thank you very much, Robert. Um, Robert, do you even want to just leave up that screen with the contact details yeah, on it? Yeah, can do. Um, be great. So just to remind you, folk, um, if you're using a laptop, please click on the Q&A uh, button on the bottom right um, to submit any questions and then just type your question into the box there. Um, if you're on a mobile this evening or an iPad, um, if you look for a three dot icon, um, that will appear whenever you tap the screen and then there should be a Q&A option there um, and select the all panelists option um, when you're submitting that question. Um, if I, you do have any specific question, please use that email address there on the screen um, and they will get back to you with um, the answer to any of your specific questions. So I suppose um, 
throughout the presentation, Robert has highlighted the problems that can arise, um, and this is what we want to avoid. So I hope this evening you can get some useful information and guidance um, and take that away with you. Um, I suppose we'll move on to the questions. Um, so I have one here. Um, are there restrictions on the control of rushes and can you still spray them? Um, Gareth, can you take that one? Yeah. Uh, in terms of rush control under AFS, there is no use of chemicals for the control of rush. But Robert has talked about earlier about NPIs. So there is a rush control NPA that you can get on your plan. This is for fields where there's a predominance of rush across the, the whole field. But in EFS, we're trying to get away from the use of chemicals. So there is a restriction there. And then there is also a restriction in terms of the dates of cutting. Generally, this is from the first, you can cut between the 1st of January and the 15th of March and also the 15th of July and the 31st of December. There is so, some circumstances where this might change, but as a general rule, it's between those dates that you can cut. Great, thank you, Gareth. Um, I have another one here. Um, Gareth again, does a farmer need to keep records during the planning stage um, that they are currently in, um, or is it just from the 1st of January whenever they start their agreement? Yeah, so in terms of keeping records, your agreement for tranche six won't actually start till the 1st of January. So you won't need to keep any records until the, the start of your agreement on the 1st of January. That is if your field isn't already in a tranche one agreement. If the field is in a tranche one agreement, you should maintain records as required for your tranche one agreement and then start your new records in your tranche six agreement uh, from the 1st of January. Great, thank you. Um, one more here, when should I pay my planner and then how do I go about claiming the money back? Uh, Ross? Yeah, uh, there'll be a, the planner will be aware of the, the dates, et cetera, for claiming the planner, um, the planner feedback. Um, it's up to you as a prior arrangement really between you yourself and the uh, and the planner when when you want to go about doing that you'll be able to see on the efs terms and conditions all the dates um that you're able to claim back for i just can't remember off the top of my head nicola at the minute but um we can certainly get back to them and, and let them know the dates yeah yeah well that's it too on the dear website there's a lot of information there and have a good look at the terms and conditions and know i suppose what you're signing yourself up for um Here's another one just in. Um, if I join EFS higher, can I also join EFS wider? Um, Ross? Yeah, your land is classified as either higher or wider. So um, they'll relate to different fields. So yes, you can have a, a higher agreement and a wider uh, agreement side by side because it will be relating to different fields on your farm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here. Must the fence always be on the field side, fields set aside? Can it be put? Um, can it be put on the boundary with other fields if it is more suitable? Um, who wants to take that, Gareth? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, the general rule is that the fence has to be on the field side of the boundary. However, there is certain circumstances where we can allow it to go on the other side. But this will be something that you'll need to discuss with your planner when he's drawing up your plan and for get the planner to flag this with us. And if we're agreeable with it, we will approve it at that stage and leave a note for the inspector. But I'll stress, no, that is a, an exception to the rule. Uh, it is generally that it has to be in the field side. Great. And I suppose as well, um, I know with wider um, as well, if you wanted to change something within the specification, um, email in the your query or your proposed change to the email address um, and get that back in writing if it is agreed or not agreed um, before you go ahead with um, making the change. 
Um, another one here, how are the livestock restrictions worked out? Ross? Yeah, no problem. Um, basically, all in your SSRMP, in your plan, each of the different options will have a grazing rate and grazing dates on it, um, which, which will detail that. When you want to calculate out um, that what it actually means for you on the ground, there's a great uh, stock checker tool on the DIR website, and you're e e e able to put in your different rates that you have, different numbers of cattle, and it'll work it out and tell you if it's um, too high or too low. It'll give you an exact uh, um, boundary which you, you can you can graze in. So it's a great tool to use, and we'd stress everybody definitely use it. SSI land is one of your desig one of your natural designations. So all SSI land would be being classed as a higher. So it would it would be eligible to be part of the plan. Are you on mute, Nicola? Yeah, you're on mute, Nicola. That's me now. Um, so that is all for questions there. Um, at the moment. So if you have any other questions or queries, please uh, send them in to the email address or use the contact number there on the screen. Um, have one more here, we'll let it slip in. Can fields be brought into the higher areas or do they remain in designated higher or wider areas? Gareth? Uh, essentially, you're your wider, if you have a wider field that is priority habitat, uh, when your planner is out, uh, get him to have a look at it. There is a process where they can submit, you know, survey the field and put in additional information. That will be submitted to NIA. The planners will be aware of this, and NIA, our colleagues within there, will then assess it to see whether it should be reclassified as a higher field. And then if it is reclassified and accepted as a higher field, it will be eligible for future schemes. Um, the deadline is generally around August time for getting these in, but it depends. No, it, it wouldn't be guaranteed that it will be eligible for Trans 7, but it wouldn't be eligible for this year's scheme. OK, thank you. Um, I suppose that will... Um, comes to the end of our evening. Um, as I say, any more questions, please send them in to the email. Um, so just to conclude, um, thank you to Robert and Gareth and Ross for your contributions to this webinar um, and to all of you for your questions. Um, I hope you found something useful um, and that you can take away some of the guidance um, so you get the best from your plan um, going forward. So just some key messages. As Robert has said, um, please engage with your planner. They're working for you. Um, it is essential to get the plan right for you and the habitat. So please talk to them and communicate with them. Um, time is of the essence. So plans are to be submitted by mid-September for these plans to then start in, on the 1st of January. So please look up that list of planners and um, get in contact with them and get the plan underway. Um, once you get the plan um, created, please read it before it is submitted. Um, as Robert has stressed, um, make sure you get a copy of the final plan and read the content before and after it is submitted. Um, and as Robert said, once the scheme agreement has been issued, you can't make any changes then. So please read it and make any changes you wish to do so before it is um, issued. And lastly, as I've said, communicate with your planner and with Countryside Management Branch. Ask them anything on the phone um, or the email and they will be able to help you. Um, don't be sitting at home thinking you don't know what to do or you have a question, please ask the question. Um, please. Um, yeah, sorry. So thank you for attending. Um, once this event is completed, please don't just shut down your screen and wait for the host to finish the call and you will then receive this short survey at the end. Thank you all for attending.